Welcome back, folks. It's Tuesday, April 9th, 2024. Born on this date in 1942, former Congressman Earl Hilliard of Birmingham. Now, he represented Alabama 7 just before Arthur Davis. In 1965, former Cincinnati Reds first baseman Hal Morris. Now, he's originally from Fort Rucker, now Fort Novacell, but played high school ball in Indiana. And in 1971, former Arizona Cardinals offensive lineman Anthony Redman of Bruton. Today, let's hit the state legislature for a public record law proposal. We also have a police chief on administrative leave, a ball coach who said no thanks to Kentucky rumors, and a statue of a Mobile native going up in Cooperstown, New York. Then, we'll talk with reporter Ivana Rinkiu on how to get a job when you've been in the joint. My name's Ike Morgan, and we're down in Alabama. A little disclosure on the first story. If you've listened long enough, you know we don't take policy positions, but when it comes to access to public records, you can count us in. Although specific laws and their language can have their own strengths and weaknesses, of course. Now, in Alabama, the government has to allow access to most public records. The problem is agencies aren't bound by deadlines on producing records that you and I might request, which means they will get to it when they get to it. Alabama ranked dead last in the U.S. for responsiveness to records requests, according to a 2019 study by a researcher at the University of Arizona. Folks, highways can be widened faster than some records are produced, if they're produced at all. AL.com's Mike Kaysen reports that a bill is going before a state senate committee today that would add timelines to the state's public records law. And if an agency doesn't make its deadlines or tries to deny your request, you could file a lawsuit. The bill comes from State Senator Arthur Orr, a Decatur Republican. It's being supported by the Alabama Press Association. The state Senate passed a similar bill last year, but it didn't come up in the House. Montgomery Mayor Stephen Reed announced that the city has placed Police Chief Darrell Albert on administrative leave reports AL.com's Carol Robinson. A statement from the city said we'll find out the reason, quote, when the matter is concluded. Also, a former police officer filed a complaint against Chief Albert last year, claiming she had been discriminated against on the job because she would not have an affair with Albert. Reportedly, the complaint included screenshots of flirty and suggestive text messages. Now, at this point, there is no confirmation that the discrimination allegations have anything to do with the Chiefs being placed on leave. Alabama men's head basketball coach Nate Oates indicated that he is not interested in moving to Kentucky, reports AL.com's Matt Stahl. And even if he were, there's that issue of an $18 million buyout that was written into his most recent contract extension after his name was being mentioned as a possible candidate for the Michigan job. Now, after news broke that John Calipari was leaving the University of Kentucky for Arkansas, Oates' name again was being mentioned as a possible candidate. So, he issued a release. Quote, Bama Nation, I am fully committed to this team and to this university. We have already accomplished some great things here, and there is nothing I want more than for the University of Alabama to win its first national championship in men's basketball. Despite any rumors to the contrary, rest assured that I will continue that pursuit as your head coach. End quote. Alabama reached its first Final Four in program history just this month. Yesterday was the 50th anniversary of Hank Aaron's 715th home run. Now that's the one that passed Babe Ruth's career total and made Aaron the all-time home run leader. Many years later, during the controversial era when players suddenly looked like Lou Ferrigno, Barry Bonds reportedly passed Aaron, if you recognize that sort of thing. That aside, Aaron's number 715 has to be a scene nearly as familiar to Americans by now as the moon landing or the flag raising on Iwo Jima. The Los Angeles Dodgers' Al Downing's pitch that he left over the plate, Atlanta Braves reliever Tom House catching the ball in the bullpen in left field, Steve Garvey shaking Aaron's hand as he rounded first, and those two crazy guys who jumped out of the stands and rounded the bases who in 
2024 would have probably been tased by security. The Braves took time before Monday's game to celebrate Aaron, who's a Mobile native who passed away just over three years ago. Also, an exhibit called More Than a Brave, The Life of Henry Aaron was opened at the Atlanta History Center. Plus, also on Monday, the National Baseball Hall of Fame announced that it will unveil a statue of Hammer and Hank on May 23rd, reports AL.com's Mark and Abinett. Now, folks, Aaron played the game the right way. You know what didn't happen after number 715? A bat flip did not happen. If number 715 doesn't get a bat flip, your home run shouldn't get a bat flip either. That's the commentary section of today's show. I believe that if people wanted to see you dance around the bases, Barishnikov would have had a contract with the Yankees. Legends play like Hank. Now we're going to take a brief break. Then we'll come back and hear from Ivana Rinku over the trouble of trying to find a job when you just got out of prison. Stay with us if you will. Well, folks, if you ever filled out a job application, then you know that you always have to disclose, usually whether you've been arrested for at least a felony, maybe a misdemeanor or a felony. And you have to imagine checking that box is not exactly helpful to your chances of getting the job. Ivana Rinku is a reporter with the Alabama Media Group, which also pays my salary. She was the host of the Facebook Live series Lunch Break with Ivana that helps so many of us keep our minds through the pandemic lockdowns and beyond. And I don't think she minds me mentioning, tell me if she and her husband recently became parents. So congratulations there. And you've also heard us pick up her stories here all the time. Now she covers prison issues for AL.com. And recently she hosted a panel on the difficulties of getting a job after you get out of the joint. One of the most useful conversations in some people's lives. Good morning, Ivana. How are you doing? Good morning, Ike. I'm well. How are you? Can you just tell us a little bit about that panel discussion? Yeah, I was really honored to be asked to host a panel at the screening of a documentary called Being Free. Well, this documentary, Being Free, is uh, produced by the folks over at Road Trip Nation, if you're familiar with them. Uh, their content usually airs on places like PBS. And this documentary followed a group of three people who were formerly incarcerated and showed them across the country as they talked to people about how to find work after you're incarcerated. Now, these three people were not locked up in Alabama. They were actually from California, but there was a stop in Alabama during the documentary. So I was really lucky to be able to host a screening of this event in downtown Birmingham and then followed by a panel that I got to host a following the screening of the movie. And it was really interesting to talk to people who have been in this situation, who were formerly incarcerated looking for work, um, and also to talk to people from the HR world, talk to people from city government. And uh, the Alabama Department of Labor Secretary was there as well to kind of talk about what they face from the state level about looking uh, to help people get work after getting out of prison. So it was a really interesting conversation. And we had people from pretty much every area that is touched by this. And I think and I hope that it gave people new perspectives walking away. I would presume some had more success than others. I mean, um, was there any magic formula for, for these these folks for finding work? The magic formula is, is luck, it seems like. And especially yeah. if you get in with a, uh, say, a legal group, if you get in with somebody like an Alabama Appleseed or the Equal Justice Initiative, or an SPLC, some of these larger legal groups that help people get out of prison uh, just through the legal world and through appeals and things like that. Sometimes when a person then gets out of prison, some of these corporations or these law firms or a nonprofit uh, will have positions that people can fill. So think about speaking, think about helping other formerly incarcerated people transition back into the real world. So that can help people who are in with a legal uh, that can help people who are in with a law firm before yeah, they yeah and to get that first job back I presume right, exactly so, exactly but that, but that is the few and far between right that's the exception a lot of people don't get out on some type of Hail Mary appeal they get out after serving their sentence or they might get out on parole not 
very often in Alabama, but they might get out on parole somewhere else. And that means they're getting out and they don't have a, a job that they can walk straight in. And a lot of people have not gotten the skills in prison that different jobs require. And then on top of all of that, you have the fact that you have to disclose if you've been convicted mm -hmm. of a felony on a lot of job applications. So there's a lot that when people come out, they aren't prepared and they say that they're not prepared for in prison to deal with when they get out. Um, one thing, and stop me Ike, if I go off on a, a tangent here, but one thing that I thought yeah, was really yeah. somebody in the documentary said, and I, I just, this made me think about it a whole new way. He said, the entire time I was locked up, I was so focused on getting out. And that's all I could think about was getting out, getting home to my children. He had one child um, with special needs as well. And so that's all he could think about was getting out to his children and to his family. And he said, well, when it came time for me to get out, I realized I had no idea what I was going to do. And he really explained this kind of sentiment in prison where people are so focused on just that one step of getting back into the free world that mm -hmm. sometimes what you're going to do in the free world and how you're going to provide for yourself without maybe resorting back to a habit that got you into prison is not on the top of your mind. Right, right. Yeah, exactly. And I, I, I guess that the states make you disclose. There's no, there's no uh, place to go that it's easier to get a job than others. It's, it's more the, the type of job you need to look for. Well, it was really interesting. The Alabama Department of Labor Secretary, uh, Secretary Washington, spoke at this event, and he talked about a job fair that the Alabama Department of Labor recently hosted, and it was solely for people who were formerly incarcerated. And I thought that was really interesting because he said, you know, we thought we'd have maybe a couple hundred people. And he said they had thousands of people show up. He, as leading the Department of Labor was blown away at the amount of people that were there. And he even said, he said, I woke up, it was a rainy day. It just wasn't a nice day. It was bad weather. I thought nobody's going to get there. And he said he showed up to the venue where the job fair was being held. And there were there was a line out the door before they opened because people were looking for work. And the Department of Labor had already spoken with the uh, employers that were at the event saying, hey, this is what the people coming in have been convicted of or they have been convicted of felonies or they they have spent time in prison or they're on parole or whatever that situation was. So the employers were already aware and they were already willing to have those conversations and already willing to interview people for these roles. And that made all the difference because you're not surprising employers with this. These are employers that are going in knowing what they're doing. And then you've got people who are coming in looking for a job. And he said it was a big success and that they, they hope to do more of those type of job fairs. Yeah, th that makes a lot of sense because, uh, you know, I can imagine employers with, you know, 30 resumes, you know, in their in their hands. And it's it's real easy to find something like they check the box about they've been in trouble with the law is a real easy way to to cull three or four of them. And yet our workplace participation rate is so low in Alabama right now, despite the fact that we have low unemployment, that for the right kind of person, for the right kind of job, I, I can imagine employers uh, are, are kind of ready to open up to people whose crimes may not at all line up with concerns they have for someone in, on the job side. I mean, and we had a person who was a leading HR executive, and uh, he also had served on a couple of White House councils for types of um, economic issues and HR issues. He was on our panel, and he said that this is not always an HR issue. He said a lot of times HR is trying to fill a role, right? They see a role that needs to be filled, a job that needs to be done. They see a person who is capable of doing that job, and they want to fill it. He said a lot of times the problem comes from people sitting next to that HR director, other people in the office who get word of this person who has been formerly incarcerated, and they're the ones who voice concerns, and it ends up being a kind of water cooler talk, if you will. I know a lot of us, I, you and I are still working from home, but that comes the narrative, and then HR sometimes doesn't have a choice in what to do because it's already become such a problem, and this person hasn't even begun work. So- he offered that perspective, which was really interesting, and um, was able to kind of say, you know, it's not always the people who want to fill the job. Sometimes it's, it's the coworker. Sometimes it's the rest of the company. So he talked about a change that needs to come from everybody in a business. It's not just the hiring managers themselves. Yeah, and so so often when we think about people who've been in trouble, 
uh, especially with a political backdrop or something like that, or water cooler talk, where we usually think of the worst of the worst, right? And that's that's certainly not not always the case. People have the the rumor mill gets going, and then something is a, co- a completely different storyline than than the truth is. Um, and also, too, I want to make a point that um, I feel like it's lost a lot. And, and I'm not sure about other states here, but Alabama, they consider somebody a violent offender for a list of offenses. And that doesn't always mean that the crime they were convicted of involved violence or involved a person getting hurt. So you can have somebody who is technically classified by the Alabama Department of Corrections as a violent offender. That doesn't mean, though, that they were uh, running around hurting people. So there's just a a kind of a game of words here that can be played. And a lot of times, if you don't speak to somebody and know their story, then a lot of that gets gets lost in translation. Now, um, uh, on another related topic, you've reported on a series about the state's parole board, how they shut the door on paroles down to less than a trickle, probably, which, you know, is another thing that gets very little sympathy because People are imagining prisons full of serial killers, right? But um, nonviolent offenders even um, who may or may not make good employees are having a tougher time getting out right now. And they were sentenced during a time when more parole, you know, the understanding was they'll be eligible for parole. I, I guess, can you talk a, just a little bit about that series? There's there's, there's a catch-22 here to you, you want to get hired right away if you can get out, but you you can't get out right now. Right. Absolutely. And I mean, if you look at Alabama, the there are plenty of jobs available. You hear from people all the time who are saying we're hiring, we're looking for work. Um, and yes, I've been working on a series uh, for AL.com. Uh, it's called Denied and it's about Alabama's broken parole system. And we've been exploring the system itself, the statistics there, how many people are getting out on parole, the more important number, how many people aren't and why that is. But I think almost more importantly is I've been telling the stories of individual people who have been denied. And like you said, Ike, they aren't always for what you would think. Um, I've reported on somebody who went in for growing uh, a little bit over two pounds of marijuana on his property. Um, He has a sentence that is effectively a life sentence for him at his age. Um, He was denied parole. I have people who are on work release, meaning that they are going out into their communities every day and they are working, right? Like we're talking about getting jobs and they are working, but the state is taking the majority uh, or a almost majority of their paycheck and then they have to go back to prison and spend the night, but then yet they don't get out on parole. So there, there is a tie here and something that I think a lot of people also forget, and this is something that our, our HR executive on our panel talked about. The people who were formerly incarcerated or people who are on parole can be the best employees that a company has, right? Because they don't want to mess up. They don't want to go back to prison if they're on parole. They need to earn money to feed their families or to help whatever issue. They need to earn money to feed their families. They need to prevent going back to prison. They need to a lot of times change their lives. And so Employers sometimes, again, we talk about this kind of water cooler talk and this idea that a lot of people have of, oh, we've got all of these serial killers coming out and looking for jobs. And and that's not necessarily the the reality there. That um, series, I think, it, it struck people different ways. And, and then the numbers are, are, are eye-popping that they used to release half and now they release like 8% or something like that on when they're eligible for parole. But honestly, I, I don't think that really catches some people's attention because they're like, well, they were sentenced, you know, you, you do the crime, you do the time. But some of these individual stories that you've done, you talked about, yeah, you are like, these people could be contributing at a time when we need more people contributing to the workforce, right? I mean, you've got to, it's it's that economic principle that you have to grow your population. It, what it really means is you have to grow your workforce participation. And that's something we're, we're kind of struggling with right now. Right. And and the Alabama Department of Corrections, there are some facilities where people can learn a trade. Right. So you think welding, you think uh, HVAC, you think cosmetology. And some people are lucky and they get in these facilities where they can learn that trade. And then when they get out, they do have this skill that they can go and take. I mean, I, you and I would all be doing, I'm sure, a lot better if we were welders. Right. Um, and that is valuable. 
But not all facilities have that option. Depending on your classification in prison, you might not have that option personally. So there's a lot of uh, a lot of variables there. The Alabama Department of Labor secretary did say that he wanted to start putting job training centers and uh, essentially centers that could help people look for work into the prisons so that they could go ahead and have kind of a head start on that before they get out. There is a center like that right now at Tutwiler, which is the women's prison. Um, and he's looking. He's hoping to be able to expand that into the men's prisons, but it's just not as easy as saying, oh, you just got out of prison. Maybe you shouldn't work here. Well, um, I have a line on a welding machine. So if you are ready to start maybe Monday, mm -hmm. I, I think I could still do this show and, and, and have a welding business. So I'll, I'll be there. You just give me the address. All right, Ivana. Well, I really appreciate you taking the time, and and thanks to everybody for listening to us. Um, we're gonna be we're gonna be back here tomorrow, and uh, until then, come by and see what we're doing on the internet at al.com. dot